everyone. Hello, and welcome to So a Neighbor Ask, a monthly series from Mountain State's Legal Foundation, where our attorneys here uh, answer your questions to help you understand the Constitution, the principles of liberty, and the law. I'm your host, Stanton Skrjanic. I'm the communications here at Mountain State. Before we begin, I want to explain who we are as Mountain State's Legal Foundation. MSLF is a nonprofit public interest law firm dedicated to restoring those rights enshrined to the Constitution at zero legal cost to our clients. We are focused on protecting property rights, economic liberty, the right to keep and bear arms, free speech and association, and equality under the law. Uh, from our headquarters in beautiful Colorado and from across the whole country, we litigate crucial cases across the nation at every level, uh, especially those that will make a difference in our country. I'm joined today by three exceptional attorneys from Mountain States, our general counsel, Will Trackman, senior counsel, Jeanette Brown, and senior attorney, Joe Bingham. It is so very great to see you three. Did you have a Merry Christmas or a happy holiday weekend at least? Me? Absolutely. I was, we celebrate Hanukkah and the Trackman family. Uh, but we had an excellent time, and we are looking forward to our New Year's, where we'll be in Bozeman, Montana. Oh, delightful, Bozeman. I, I haven't been to Montana yet, so I'm hoping to get out there soon. It sounds like just beautiful country. It is. Shana, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, it was good. We had a few logistical challenges working around the storm. Got a few people in early, actually, but uh, it was good. I was able to make it out to the eastern plains of Colorado where my uh, where my family lives, and it got bone chilling cold. I haven't <laughs> experienced anything like that in a long time. So, the storms, Southwest flights, you name it, just a whole whole uh, whole whole mess. How about you, Joe? Um, it was a challenge I'm enjoying this week more than I enjoyed last week, but um, <laughs> I think the kids would probably say the reverse. So that's what really matters, right? I suppose that's <laughs> fair. I suppose that works. Uh, for our viewers online, after we chat here about our question today, um, about a half hour or so, we're going to have a question and answer session uh, uh, to close out the episode. So if you are joining us here on Zoom, uh, you can find that at the bottom of kind of Q&A portal where you can ask your questions. And if you are on Facebook, you're also able to uh, ask your questions there as well. Uh, and we'll be able to try your comments as best we can. So let's get to it. Will, Jeanette, Joe, here's our question. How did Liberty fare in 2022? Uh, what, what's your one sentence kind of understanding of how did our freedoms survive? How did our liberties do in this past year? Well, I'll go ahead and start and then uh, turn it over to the other other panelists here. Uh, it sort of fared the same way that um, Hercules fared when he started defeating Hydra, where you uh, cut one head off and four grow in its place. So you feel like you're doing pretty well. Obviously, Mount States is in a lot of important battles uh, right now and winning a lot of those battles. At the same time, the Biden administration and state governments throughout the country are in full uh, steam ahead mode with moving against liberty uh, and trying to narrow the rights of Americans, whether that be in free speech and equal protection and guns. And so as good of a year as liberty had, it is going to be just as challenging next year and the year after and for the foreseeable future. I like that example. Cut off one head and three more grown in its place. So always looking for that heart, always looking for that that one point where we can make Really solid, impactful change. I love that. John, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, 2022 for Liberty was a year of hope and progress, I think, largely um, the, some of the Supreme Court decisions that were issued, the tenor and the questions, and some of the Supreme Court arguments that have not yet become decisions or been resolved, and in particular, in some of our cases here at MSLF, we won some important victories on long-standing cases, on brand new cases, uh, and so us, and for our cases and our clients, it was a good year. Excellent, and we're going to be talking about a lot of those cases uh, in this episode, because we have a lot of victories to celebrate, and a lot of uh, action to look forward to as we go into the new year. Joe, how about yourself? How, how did Liberty fare in 2022? Um, well, 2022 made me uh, fairly optimistic about at least Liberty in the legal world going forward um, because it's become clear that certainly more than any time 
in my lifetime or in my parents' lifetime, we have a Supreme Court that is committed to its oath to the written constitution and um, to enforcing the text of that document. And um, independently of the outcome of any specific case, um, I think that's what we should demand from our Supreme Court. And um, and since the uh, vision of liberty that Mountain States has uh, is embodied in the written constitution, um, I think it's good news for liberty that we have a court that's committed to it. I, I think you're absolutely right. No, we we have a lot of uh, a lot of supporters out there, you know, who who express their concerns about the courts in the future, and it's it is really optimistic to see that our our the, our Supreme Court has a sort of originalist jurisprudence starting to emerge as the defining characteristic of hopefully this decade and decades to come. So uh, I'm excited to hear you talk about that more as we as we go along. Um, let's 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 talk about some of those cases because we have. We've had a lot of casework in 2022, um, cases that started earlier, cases that started this year, uh, that had significant progress and, and even some major victories. Um, and I know each of you have, have specific examples in mind, so I'd love to love to hear it. So uh, you know, feel free to jump in. Will, go ahead and take the sure. take on this. Yeah, well, I head up the equal protection practice and the First Amendment speech and association practice at Mountain States. So in the equal protection area, this was a year of victories. In 2021, we brought three suits challenging the Biden administration's American Rescue Plan Act. That was way back in March of 2021, if you remember, right out of the gate. Uh, Congress spent $1.9 trillion on COVID-19 uh, funds and included as part of that program a farmer and rancher subsidy uh, for farm debt for any farmer or rancher who had a loan from the FSA, as long as they didn't have white skin. Uh, and our client, Liesl Carpenter, is Norwegian and Caucasian. Uh, of course, she's an American. And that program discriminated against her based on her race. We also brought two other suits, one in Tennessee called Holman, where we obtained a preliminary injunction halting that program, and then another case in Colorado. Those cases were uh, pr proceeding nicely. And then in 2022, the Congress decided, you know what, we don't think these programs are actually going to survive. The court challenges, they've already been preliminarily enjoined in the Holman matter. And so they went ahead and repealed the entire program as part of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed just a few months ago. And so those programs being repealed is a major victory. Congress saw the writing on the wall. They knew they couldn't get away with the bare, uh, bare racial preferences that they had imposed in the in that bill. And they're going to have to restructure whatever COVID-19 relief they have or other relief program. And so this was a huge loss for the Biden administration and for race discrimination generally. Now, what are we doing about that? Well, we, we haven't given up. Uh, we've decided to seek fees, attorney fees, against the federal government in the Holman matter. And we're continuing to press the case in Colorado and in Wyoming with Liesl Carpenter's case, arguing that those cases aren't moot and aren't resolved until every single payment that the US Department of Agriculture issued before we got the injunction is clawed back and returned to the federal coffers. And until that point, the cases continue. So we're litigating that. We're before the 10th Circuit in the Carpenter case. And we're excited. It's going to be a fun appeal, uh, as fun as any appeal can be when you're facing uh, the government. But we want to win that and say, look, anytime you start doling out money based on race, not only do you have to stop, but you're going to have to take money back from people when you've already given it out. Yeah. When, when I when I first started working for Mountain States and I heard about this case with Liesl and, and the others, I was I was kind of flabbergasted that the federal government is still engaging in race based discrimination, though it doesn't look like the same race based discrimination back in the 60s and 70s. It's just it's kind of kind of disgusting. I'm glad Mountain State was able to do something about it, force that change in legislation. Um, can you can you help me understand? Because I, I I understand the idea of, of clawing back that money. Can you help me understand the more why that's so important for for the principle of equality under the law? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, Dan. So the Biden administration is doing this a lot in terms of trying to take money from large spending bills 
allocate it to their agencies, whether it's the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Education or some other agency and say, we want you to have a grant program, whether it's about farming or ranching or soil or school school districts and education. And we want you to have um, so-called equity at the heart of that subsidy program. And so a lot of times what happens is funds start going out the door before courts can rule on whether the program is constitutional or not. And if every time you win the constitutional argument in court, the government throws in the towel, then at least some of the money gets out the door and that's a win for uh, discrimination. And so what we're arguing is you have to get that money back. You have to claw it back, especially in Liesl's case, where the money went out uh, basically on a ledger to certain farmers and ranchers, and the government can always correct those ledgers and get the money back that it uh, forgave in uh, debts to those folks. So in those cases, you want to not only beat the government, but you want to send a message that whatever unconstitutional conduct that they get out the door uh, before they lose has to be unwound. Yeah, it's 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 kind of the idea of you stopping future programs from doing the same kind of thing of starting it, stopping it because they're getting sued and just over and over, just stop that pattern altogether. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That that makes sense. Um, well, great. I'm glad we we were able to win that win that for uh, for Liesl and the others. Um, and I'm happy to hear that we're continuing to push that appeal forward and hopefully just end this practice once and for all. Um, Jeanette, did you have a particular case that you had in mind? Uh, well, sort of relatedly, we have the Brigida case, which is a case that Mountain States has been involved in since 2015, at least, uh, when it was filed in the courts. It also was a uh, race discrimination type case, but in that instance, it was race discrimination by the federal government in their employment processes. In particular, they refused to hire some of the most qualified air traffic controller candidates in 2014 um, in favor of people who passed a biological screening mechanism that was designed to change the racial makeup of the successful applicants. So this year in February, after fighting that case for almost five years, we finally won class certification. And so now Mountain States Legal Foundation represents over 900 individuals who went to college, got degrees, passed an FAA created aptitude test that proved that they were qualified to be air traffic controllers um, and all were turned down for, or really not even fully considered for those positions due to, for example, not taking enough or taking too many art credit classes in college. Wow. Um, <laughs> I, I know that we that Mountain States has been on this case for a long, like you said, 2015 at least. This is this is a this is a, a, a huge endeavor. And I know a lot of our supporters are really concerned about this case. What what is it about class action that makes this so much more impactful, right? Because no, we, we kind of have a general understanding of what class action is, but why is it important for this case particularly? Well, class action is an efficient way to represent a lot of people on the same issue at the same time. And in particular, like I said, in this instance, we're able to represent over 900 people who applied for the exact same employment application and were all denied for the exact same reason. Normally, when you litigate a case, one of the factors that the courts consider when determining how much discovery they're going to allow, as in how many documents they're going to require the, the government to produce or how many witnesses can be examined under oath, they consider a thing called proportionality. And the larger a case, the more thorough you can be in discovery. So by aggregating these cases, we have the leverage to really get into what happened rather than being limited as we would if it were an individual recovery. Okay, so we can, we can start diving in more and more into the kind of FAA's decision-making, all of its documentation. This provides a grander scope to, to make sure that we can hold the government accountable on, again, <laughs> race-based discrimination, which still is just insane to me that we keep doing this. Well, okay, well, fantastic. Um, where, where do you see this case kind of going into 23? 
Well, unfortunately, even though it's sort of long in the tooth, um, in 2023, we are slated to spend pretty much the entire year going through that discovery process that I talked about. Mm -hmm. The government still has tens of thousands of documents that it needs to produce. Um, it's been sort of slow rolling that process. There are not all of the witnesses who still need to be examined in a deposition. Um, and then at the end of the year, we will have uh, a bevy of experts involved who will testify about things like the um, the standards that should go into an employment selection method and how the government did deviate from those standards, um, as well as some of the statistical issues, et cetera, that you would expect in a case of this scope. So we'll spend most of this year um, on discovery and taking depositions, doing expert reports, um, and then hopefully have a trial next year. I can't wait for the trial. And I'm, <laughs> I know, I know the, the idea of, of, of discovering deposition is not, you know, the, the the sexiest of things for 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 law. But this is big stuff. This is this is the the, the meat and the potatoes of trying to get uh, accountability on this program. You can only win a case with evidence and you can only get that evidence and discovery most of the time. So we have to go through this process. And I enjoy the process because it is really sort of an investigative process. And this time we get to aim that investigative process at the government. And they're very much not accustomed to that. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And Jeanette is being a little bit modest. We have a pending attorney fee motion against the government for suggesting that the scope of discovery ought to be more narrow. And the judge already ruled in our favor that it ought not be. And now we're just seeking fees for having to litigate that question. Yeah, despite the fact that we're representing 900 some people, the government tries to diminish this case and convince themselves and the court that there's really not that much at stake. But re in reality, there's much more than just the 900 people and their individual incidents of discrimination, which are important. Um, what's at stake here, like with the farmer rancher case, is a broad, now it's called government sort of whole of government approach to discrimination, and whether or not that discrimination is actually mandated by some of the EEOC guidelines for the federal government as an employer. Um, so we'd like to get to the heart of the federal government as a discriminatory employer um, and go beyond just the FAA. Yeah, no, yeah, our, our our target is the FBA, but our scope hopefully hopefully gets to a much broader degree. Absolutely, um, Joe. I know you, you and I were talking earlier about some of the major wins you had this year. Can you help me out here? What 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 uh, what happened to your neck of the woods? Um, well, <clears throat> we've made progress in a uh, number of farmer rancher cases. Um, one that uh, originated as Jeanette's case. Um, was our win in the upper green matter where we're defending the right of the ranchers who have grazed in the Yellowstone area on um, federal forest lands for over a century to keep doing that. Um, environmentalists had uh, challenged the federal government's decision to let them keep grazing um, on the basis that, um, that basically the ranchers should hand over all this territory to the grizzly bear population, which has um, made a remarkable recovery in the Yellowstone area. Um, so we won that case, um, and not necessarily before the most sympathetic judge. Um, and the environmentalists have appealed to the 10th circuit. And so we just um, finished briefing in that case and we'll um, expect a ruling I'm optimistic that it will be favorable um, next year. Um, related to our farmer rancher federal land use cases, um, we brought a case defending the um, <clears throat> Forest Service's new forest plan for the Rio Grande National Forest. Um, and environmentalists were attacking that. Um, and their attack on that forest plan is kind of parallel to their attack on the um, decision to let ranchers keep grazing in uh, Yellowstone on forest lands um, because the Forest Service has a statutory multiple use mandate, which means that they have to provide forest lands for all kinds of uses, um, including conservationist uses, uh, but also including productive uses uh, like 
uh, ranching and also recreational uses. And environmentalists had sued challenging the Rio Grande Forest Plan, arguing that it was too favorable to people like our clients who um, are motorized recreational forest users, trail riders basically, who ride um, their dirt bikes or cycles on uh, trails that are designated for that purpose in the forest. Um, and uh, recreation is actually the first um, mandated use uh, provided for in the federal statute. Um, and um, <clears throat> so we wrapped up briefing in that case and are waiting for a decision in that hopefully soon too. So, um, so on, on, on these two cases, right, the one with, with the ranchers in uh, Wyoming, right? Is that right? Uh, that's right. Yeah. So the ranchers in Wyoming and then uh, the, the, the recreationalists, the motorists in, in, in Rio Grande, both those cases, we weren't the original two parties, right? One of the original parties. We were, we, we intervened in that case representing the ranchers or representing recreationalists. What, what is this, this pattern? Cause I, we, I think we've touched on this before on So a Neighbor Ass on the show, but help me out here. How, what, what is going on? What are these groups doing to sue the government? We're actually coming to the aid of the government on these questions, which sounds kind of odd given some of our, some of our other cases. Um, so what, what is this pattern? Help me understand this a little bit more. Right. Um, well, the, uh, the problem is that whenever the federal government makes a good decision, environmentalists immediately challenge to try to put a stop to its good decision. Um, and so when that happens, you will often find us intervening on the side of the government um, to defend the private interests in whom the government's decision uh, was made, or the, the private parties who it favored um, over ideologues. And um, actually, in the next case I'm going to talk about, we're also intervening, but this time it's against the federal government. Um, and so you'll you'll you know find us on whichever side is right, regardless of which side the government is on. <laughs> so, and, and I like how you said it, right? You know, we're representing private parties, but really, what at least on, on on a few of those cases, what we're really doing is we're we're fighting for that principle of public land public use, right? Conservation is important, certainly, but so is industry, so is recreation, and we should enjoy the the, the bounties of, of that land. And these groups are just, they're so, well, I like how you say that they're, they're ideologues, they're, they're one-minded, right? Only one, only one thing, and that's, that's not only unjust, is, is, isn't that violate the law itself? Isn't there something about the law of uh, you can't just do one thing with a piece of land? Um, yes, and that's exactly, I mean, that is the uh, contrary position to the multiple use mandate that's in statute for the Forest Service, which says, um, which mandates that the Forest Service provide for multiple different uses, um, not just conservation. Um, and um, yeah, so it, it does help to um, have the law on our side. You, you think, right? But you no, know, sometimes you get a judge here or there. I mean, I'm, I'm sure all you have stories about that. <laughs> yes, there are some courts where it helps more than others. Well, well, perfect. Can't see, can't wait to see how how this how this plays out. Um, we have a couple questions, but we're we're only 20 minutes in. We have plenty of time to talk about more of our victories or more of our uh, you know, liberty sounded like it did pretty well. I know equal protection seems to be. Uh, getting getting some wins here. So is the idea of private property and and beneficial use of property. Um, how about some free speech and some some Second Amendment cases? How are we doing there? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about some free speech cases and uh, then turn it over to Jeanette to talk about uh, some of the important work that we're doing in the Second Amendment space. Uh, Mountain States has had a free speech practice for a while. It's been newly rejuvenated. Uh, since last year and 2022 was a major year for us to boost our activity, look for new clients, look for new areas. We have filed a number of briefs in Supreme Court cases as amicus or friend of the court. And in those cases, we've consistently had success. So we've urged the court to take a Colorado case called 303 Creative, where a website designer is being compelled to develop websites for same sex couples. We filed a brief in a case called Kennedy, where the court uh, evaluated and ruled in favor of a football coach who was being told 
He could not pray on the 50 yard line after the football game was over and on his own. And we recently filed a brief in a case called Klein out of Oregon, which probably sounds a little bit similar to three or three creative involving a baker who is being compelled to uh, bake cakes for same sex weddings. In each of those cases, there's a religious angle to it because the speaker was motivated by their personal religious beliefs. But Mount States didn't emphasize those arguments. We emphasized the speech arguments specifically because it doesn't really matter why you're motivated to speak or not speak when the government asks or suggests that you ought to be compelled to speak. And so we've emphasized that the First Amendment uh, protects these individuals regardless of their religious beliefs and prevents the government from forcing them to speak or not speak. The First Amendment Practice Group is going to have a big 2023, I can tell you already. And we're looking for new areas in compelled speech and new areas to make a difference. We think that the Supreme Court, which heard argument in 303 Creative, is going to hand down a very sweeping ruling uh, next year in favor of protecting um, individuals from being forced to speak messages they don't agree with. And that will be a jumping off point for any number of cases. And we are excited and uh, honestly just energetic about this practice group uh, and where it's going in the future. Yeah, you, you mentioned you mentioned the, the Kennedy um, uh, v. Bremerton, I think, the Bremerton, yeah. Supreme, right? Yeah, that was a win. That's a big win for, for, for freedom of speech, right? For the First Amendment. It is. That, that's a yeah. Good that was not a religious freedom case. I mean, obviously, prayer is about religion, and uh, Coach Kennedy was praying to God. But that was a speech case. The fact that someone is allowed to speak and pray on the 50-yard line without running afoul of uh, other parts of the Constitution that the school district said it had to enforce, like the Establishment Clause. So we were very pleased with that win. And when we got in and involved at 303 Creative, that was not yet at the Supreme Court. We urged the Supreme Court to take that case, which they then did. And now we've urged them to issue a ruling in favor of the website designer, which we expect them to do uh, next year. So one amicus kind of helped to get it up into the court. And you no, know, hopefully the next one could get a Another win, another victory for for free speech. Uh, Before I move on from 303, this sounds like a case that already got to the Supreme Court and was decided. Uh, Another another baker. Um, What's why is this brought up again? Why are we discussing the two? Why is this here again? Didn't we decide this already? Yeah, it's a great question. So you probably have heard of the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, which is also a Colorado case involving a gentleman named Jack Phillips, who was asked to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of Jack Phillips, although it was on religious grounds and not on speech grounds. And so these cases do involve speech. The difference is there's a debate about whether a cake is speech or not speech. Here, the Tenth Circuit said, Uh, we acknowledge that a website is speech. We don't care. We are going to compel the website designer to develop that website, even though it is her personal speech in the interest of non-discrimination against gays. So that was a very, very broad ruling. And that's why we got involved as a friend of the court to say, you have to take this case and rule the other direction. Yeah, all the more important that this gets up there because the First Amendment is more than religion, right? It's it's all of the things that, that yeah. are entitled, including speech. I love it. And association, which we also cover. Yes, yes. I can't can't forget association. That's that's how we're all here. <laughs> the Tenth Circuit uh, really went a long way in that case. I mean, they took it so far as to say that the purpose of Colorado's law was to um, purge Lori Smith's viewpoint from public discourse, and uh, and that was okay. <laughs> Wow, that's yeah. all all the more important that we that we help get this at the Supreme Court. All the more. Um Jeanne, uh Will said you had a second amendment case. Is this is this the 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 big one, Vanderstock? Is this what I'm what I'm hearing? Well, yes and no. So um as I mentioned at the outset, you know, Liberty had some victories this year in the Supreme Court and in some of our cases. So in the Supreme Court, we had the Bruin case, obviously, which was Uh, sort of a resounding win for the Second Amendment in terms of the Supreme Court saying we meant what we said in Heller and McDonald, and yes, there is a Second Amendment right, and yes, it is based on text 
history and tradition. And so all of these things that the courts of appeals had decided weren't really subject to or the quote unquote core of the Second Amendment are now sort of back in play. But the Vanderstock case technically, while it um, relates to the ATF and its regulation of firearms, um, it's not actually a Second Amendment case. It's based on Second Amendment principles. Um, but it's a case brought under the Administrative Procedure Act, like a lot of the cases that Joe brings in our natural resources practice. Um, and it's also brought on constitutional grounds in that what happened in Vanderstock is um, the Biden administration through the ATF decided that it would rewrite the statutory definition of firearms to expand the items that the ATF and then the Department of Justice could regulate. And so they changed the definition of firearm and they changed the definition of a frame or receiver of firearm to allow them to regulate more, to reach back further into the manufacturing process to regulate items that could become part of a firearm. Um, and so in August, this is one of the new cases where we've also had a quick victory. Um, in August, we filed a lawsuit challenging the final rule issued by the ATF and the DOJ saying we get to regulate these things um, under some of the most um, loose subjective tests that you can imagine. Um, so we filed a lawsuit challenging that. We sought a preliminary injunction so that that rule would not become effective. We won preliminary injunction as it related to a manufacturing client that we represent who manufactures parts and also to two of the individual plaintiffs. We represent um, uh, Firearms Policy Coalition as well as one of the plaintiffs in that case. So that case has moved very quickly. We won a preliminary injunction. We then got the preliminary injunction expanded to tactical machining clients. Um, the government has already appealed that part of the case. And so we have a brief due on that next month, but right before Christmas on the 23rd, we filed a motion for summary judgment in that case, seeking to have the final rule completely struck on the basis that it's beyond the government's authority, that it was arbitrary and capricious, um, that uh, it violates constitutional concerns such as um, free speech because it regulates instructions and marketing materials, due process because you can't actually figure out what it does regulate necessarily, um, as well as separation of powers take clause concerns, take care clause concerns. So um, for you, all you just named all, all the things that government students learn, like they violated this, they violated that, they violated this. Like <laughs> there's not a single thing they didn't touch on in Vander Stock. <laughs> That's what it seemed like when we were writing the brief. I can assure you it's a very long, thorough brief um, that touches on a lot of topics, and those will probably all be reprised in front of the uh, Fifth Circuit. So um, that has been a very intense case with a lot of quick deadlines. There have been interveners in that case. So the, the deadlines just revolve around and around and around, and they will through February. Yeah. Um, right. The thing that I want to do while I've got the mic is that's our newest win, but our oldest case, um, which is Solonex, we also had a big win in. Uh, we won summary judgment when the government tried to cancel a 30-year-old oil and gas lease. And that case will also be up on appeal next year. But in September, Judge Leon of the um, D.C. federal court, um, the district court in D.C., ruled that the striking or the cancellation of the lease was uh, illegal. And he went as far as to say Kafka-esque. Um, <laughs> the government had approved it, approved it, approved it, put it on hold, put it on ice for decades and then when we won an action forcing the government to take action, they just canceled the lease. Um, so that one will be up in the coming year. But that case we have been involved in since, I believe, 2007. So. Another long legacy kind of case here. Um, that, you know, and, and for, for many of our listeners, we, we've we done an episode on Vanderstock. We did an episode on Solnex because these these are they were big wins. They're they're moving forward. Yeah, they'll let the federal government appeal. They'll they'll have their day in court just like anyone else. But we'll win there too. Um, <laughs> I want to go back a little bit to um, you, one of the first things you mentioned, Bruin, because we were involved in that. I, everyone remembered Bruin. We did a, a SCOTUS watch during the summer to talk about that case. 
um, and how it was a, a major thing for us. Uh, help, help me understand her, because that's a big win for, for Liberty, for Second Amendment. You know, our, our victories in, in Vanderstock are, are continuing that. Um, what does 23 look like? Because there are a lot of states that are trying to get around Bruin by using Bruin, but this is kind of icky stuff. How does, what are the prospects for the next year? Uh, it looks good for a litigator. I got to tell you, there's going to be a lot of issues that come up that sort of have been lurking in the background, but haven't come to the forefront because of the way a lot of the courts have appealed had, a pro had applied the Supreme Court precedent prior to Bruin. So now governments, um, states in particular like New York, California, some of those states are going to run to what they consider to be a safe haven of sensitive places or the sensitive places doctrine. Um, because the Supreme Court has recognized there are places or circumstances where it's not appropriate for a particular person to bear arms or to bear arms in a particular place. Um, and so now the state and local governments are going to be seeking to expand those exceptions to the natural right to self-defense and to keep and bear arms. So we're going to see a lot of, of like I said, sensitive places. That was what um, caused New York um, and some people in New York to give up uh, reenactments because they were afraid that they were going to offend people or make people afraid um, based on the fact that they had mock weapons for their historical reenactments. And so the governments are really reaching very far. And in New York, for instance, um, under some of their new laws, you can't bear an arm unless the uh, business owner publicly posts that you're permitted to do so, which is obviously sort of trying to make use not only of the force of law, but the force of public opinion in some of those places um, and do exactly what the Constitution was meant to stop, which is sort of the tyranny of the majority uh, taking rights away from an unfavored group or position. So, so a lot of successes, a lot of successes, but still work to be done in the, in the coming years. Exactly. So, yeah. I, I think that's really important because, you know, we're here to celebrate, but we're also here to reaffirm that our work is not done and it's not done until, until we have that shining city on a hill. Right. Um, Joe, you had mentioned a case. I don't know if this is what you're talking about, uh, we filed a case earlier this year, US v. Idaho. Um, that was another intervening one. We're actually fighting against the federal government. What's what's this case about? Um, yeah, that's actually the case I'm most excited about right now. Um, and in that case, it's um, <clears throat> the United States government is um, suing the state of Idaho. And, um, and we are intervening on the side of the state representing the ranchers who are likely to be affected by the outcome of the case. Um, basically, uh, the Supreme Court said a long time ago in the 70s, if I remember right, that um, that state law governs uh, the private water rights, ownership of private water rights on um, federal land for grazing purposes. And these are called stock water rights. It's the right to water your stock um, at a particular place. and. Um, and of course, there are lots of ranchers in Idaho who are grazing their cattle on federal lands. And um, the federal government has been trying since before then to um, kind of appropriate those water rights so that it can exert more control over the um, ranchers who are entitled to graze cattle there uh, or other livestock. Uh, we also represent a sheep ranch. Um, but um, so the... Uh, the United States Supreme Court said state law controls water rights. Uh, the Idaho Supreme Court said that um, under state law, you have to put a water right to what's called beneficial use. You have to use the water right if you want to keep it. And that what the federal government was doing um, by letting ranchers graze cattle there was not did not count as beneficial use by the federal government because the federal government in uh, most cases um, for our purposes, effectively all cases, does not own and graze cattle on these lands, um, the ranchers do. And so <clears throat> it's the ranchers who are putting it to beneficial use. Um, and Idaho's legislature created an administrative system to uh, kind of scrutinize all these water rights that the federal government had been decreed 
to uh, see if they had been forfeited for lack of beneficial use, um, which they pretty clearly have in a lot of cases. And so the United States government sued Idaho and said, um, well, OK, maybe uh, maybe we have forfeited these water rights under state law, but um, you're not allowed to look at it and ask that question. Uh, we <laughs> want to see your state law struck down as unconstitutional um, because it's uh, unconstitutional for you to um, to check on whether we uh, still have the right to these Stockwater rights under state law. Um, and so we're trying to intervene to represent the ranchers who will be affected if the government succeeds in <laughs> hold on, um, hold on continuing second. to appropriate these rights. Yeah, I, all right. All right. I, I'm not I'm not a lawyer, clearly by my title. But you, you're are you telling me that the federal government is willingly acknowledged? Yeah, we're not following Idaho's law. Yes, we know the Supreme Court said that uh, I guess states can control their own water. But you can't do it anyway because we're the feds. Because it's super. What 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 is this? Not? Um, I would give an F on a student's paper for this. I probably used a little hyperbole in that uh, I don't think that if I said, uh, "So you agree that you forfeited all these rights under state law?" I don't think they would say yes. Um, but I uh, I don't think that they could. Um, deny it in front of a court with a straight face either probably uh, i mean if, if they thought they could win on the state law then that's what they would be fighting they wouldn't just be trying to um avoid the uh adjudication altogether by um getting the state's system for adjudicating these rights struck down wow this is i i can't wait to see how this how this plays out in 23 this is um, wow is the general reaction to all the fact patterns in our cases. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Um, okay, I have a couple questions here from our audience before we get to them. Any kind of uh, uh, last minute uh, uh, highlights of some some really stellar cases that you guys had in mind? Well, I do want to thank everyone for the support and especially our contributors. And obviously all of our attorneys and staff for the amazing 2022 that we had. We are so excited about 2023 because you ain't seen nothing yet, right? We, uh, we're going to have a great year ahead of us. And um, the victories that we've had are um, important and ever more important is the fact that we continue having those victories because there is no rest on the other side of these fights. Yeah, my father always told me the reward for good work is more work. And we did good work in 2022. We've got more work to do in 2023 and beyond. So. That's, a, that's a great, that's a, that's, that is very apropos for, for what we do. Good work is reward with more good work. That's sort of like being general counsel too. <laughs> I, 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 I understand that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this, this is an excellent question. Um, before I ask, uh, before I uh, ask it on behalf, um, so we do primarily more or less four areas of, of law, right? You know, natural resources and, and private property, um, Second Amendment litigation, uh, uh, or the right to keep marijuana, uh, yeah. uh, free speech, specifically compelled speech and association, and um, and uh, an equal protection of the law, right? Those are what we focus on. We have a really good question here from uh, Saul Raw. Uh, they ask, how does Mountain States decide which cases to take? What are the criteria? Can you give examples of which types of cases are rejected? Yeah, it's a great question. So thank you, thank you for it. So a case has to hit a number of really key factors for us. It has to be broad based in the sense that it would set a major precedent, uh, not just an individual fight, as many uh, valiant fights as there are between the government and individuals. It can't be so unique that even if we prevailed, uh, it would affect nothing else besides those cases. And then we actually have a series of criteria in our bylaws and our um, manual to decide, okay, is this, a, um, is this a fight that's going to expand liberty? Is this a David versus Goliath type fight? Can this person uh, go with other counsel and do just as much 
uh, in terms of their service to Liberty. And so we have to do a number of those analyses before we take a case in terms of what cases we reject. You know, we take a, or we reject a lot of cases that I wish we didn't have to. Uh, we're an eight attorney team uh, when we're fully staffed. And so that means that there's only so much bandwidth, uh, but we take as much as we can. Uh, when we reject a case, it's usually for one of those reasons, either it's not not a case that's going to prevail or not a case, even if it did prevail, what it set a nationwide precedent on a topic or at least a statewide precedent on a topic. So we are looking for those cases that can have the maximum uh, impact and uh, a radius effect when when we prevail. So and, 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 and those those criteria, along with the fact that they may not be within our domain, so like. Foreign policy, we don't do. We don't. We don't. Of course, yeah. immigration, right? Those are those are outside of our of our our specific practice group areas. That's right. So, if someone brought, for instance, a free exercise of religion and claim to us, obviously, uh, as people in the liberty movement, uh, I'm personally supportive of free exercise. But Mountain States uh, doesn't have that as one of its practice groups. And. Um, because we have so many friends uh, within the broader um, liberty legal movement, sometimes we're able to help people whose cases we can't take by um, connecting them with people we know who can. So. Exactly. Now that, that's a, that's an excellent point. So if, if people did have a, a, a potential case, they shouldn't be afraid to come ask us because we might be able to have those those essential connections to put them in 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 place where those in the liberty movement can truly help them. Yeah, that that's that's an excellent point. Okay, beautiful. Um, I have an, uh, not so much a question, but sort of a, a comment from uh, John. I'm, I'm not even I'm not even attempt that 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 last name. Uh, John is saying uh, Mount States has done so much for the liberty movement, um, and there's. Uh, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. 45 years of, of really great history. What does the next 45 years look like for Mountain States? Well, uh, you know, the next year is what we've been talking about. 2023 looks fantastic for us. I can't speak to what's going to happen in 2068, but I have no reason to doubt that the next 45 years are also going to be strong. I mean, the fact of the matter is that whatever victory we win has to be enduring. It has to set that precedent in order so that in 10 years, we're still talking uh, about liberty and what we can do. Biden is going to come and go. You know, he's going to be in office, he's going to be out of office. But the fact that matters is what legacy we leave with our victories. And that's why I'm so thankful for our supporters, because they think the same way. What legacy can I leave for my kids, my grandkids? Because the next 45 years are going to be fraught ones. It's going to be hard to preserve the victories that we won. Uh, if it weren't hard, it wouldn't be worth doing. Uh, it's going to be a challenge, but it's a challenge that we are eminently capable of taking on and succeeding in as long as we have the resources and the talent and the attorneys and the judges that we need in order to make these cases, whether that be a case based on the Constitution or the Administrative Procedure Act or something else that can be used to stop the government from going beyond its proper role. That's what we see at Mountain States. It'll be our mission and vision next year, the year after, and 45 years from now. Yeah, and, and to sort of follow up on that, the reason that we have separation of powers in our government is to so that one branch protects against another branch, aggrandizing power to itself. Right now, in a lot of the cases that we're dealing with, we're dealing with executive branches, executive agencies, and whether it's as an employer or through their rulemaking and their agency decisions. Um, they're you know taking more power to themselves and claiming more expertise, um, and it's a it's without regard to whoever may be the president. There is an inertia to these agencies where they want to expand their power. They think that they have something they want to accomplish, and so they want to justify doing that. And so we will, for the foreseeable future, have to be keeping those agencies and those executive branches, that those representatives of the executive branch in check um, because they want to grow um, and, and do what they would consider to be good things, but their good things inevitably end up impinging on liberty. Um, and so we don't want the Forest Service to think that it can regulate 
um, to the point of protecting every type of jumping mouse. And we don't want um, the ATF thinking that they can get into regulating speech and the manufacturing process. And I think that it's fortuitous right now that we're here where you have this court um, and sort of a move to limit deference to agencies um, that exist to counteract at the same time this sort of new whole of government approach where the executive wants to take every branch and throw it at a quote unquote problem, even if it's well outside that particular agency's purview. Um, so I think that we're going to have to work to take advantage of this, you know, these things coming together to try and work one against the other and limit the agencies in what they do and limit deference to them and limit sort of the the rule of experts. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and oh, oh. I, sorry, just to Jeanette's point, politics really doesn't matter to us. You know, we, we end up suing the Biden administration and Bridget and I were suing over Obama, but we're also suing over what bureaucrats did under Trump. And uh, I worked in the Trump administration, but that doesn't matter when it comes to liberty. If your policy comes at liberty, we will come at your policy. Uh, and it doesn't really matter who's on the other side of the pleading when, when we're doing that. Joe? Uh, well, and part of the reason for that, I think, is that uh, most political battles are... Uh, are pretty short term. Um, you know, we think in one or two year or four year at most um, increments about policy battles um, and elections. But the battles that Mountain States is fighting are really generational. Um, I mean, at the Supreme Court, we're just now seeing fruits from hard work that people started doing in the 1980s in our movement. And um, I think uh, we can do work now that uh, will still be having an impact 20 years from now. Um, you know, 50 years from now, we might have two different political parties from the ones we have now. Um, but the uh, the legal progress that we've made could well still be in place regardless. I I, I think I can summarize what each of you are saying. Uh, it, 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 uh, no, as, as the host, just, that's my job. Liberty is not a spectator sport. We are principles over politics. Um, and the future looks good, even if it looks hard. That, does that sound about right for everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Good job. You're a good comms manager. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I can only do so much with the law. So if I, can, <laughs> if I can make it sound beautiful, I will make it sound as beautiful as I can. All right. Um, I think I think that's gonna that, that's gonna wrap it up for us here. So I will um I'll just say thank you to everyone for joining us on this epi episode of uh, So Neighbor Asked. Uh, within a week, we should have this webinar uploaded to our YouTube and our social media for your future viewing. Uh, in the meantime, you can be sure to stay up to date with our most important work and for 2023 at our website at mslegal.org, and you can follow us at Twitter at mslf. Instagram at Mountain States Legal. And of course, you can find us on Facebook, especially those who, uh, who, are, uh, who are watching online. Uh, thank you again. We look so forward to seeing you next month. Uh, have a very happy new year. Thank you. Thanks, neighbors.